Okay, so thank you, uh, Arnav, thank you, Chema, for embarrassing me for that <laughs> wonderful introduction. Thank you, uh, Thomas Rosen, and Thomas Stood here for the opportunity to speak to you as a, as a keynote lecturer here today. Really appreciate it. It was an unexpected surprise. The title of my presentation today is Le Fiel Rouge. I'm going to explain what Le Fiel Rouge means in a few minutes. Uh, but what I've been doing for the better part of a decade is exploring dynamics at the intersection between human and engineered networks in my research. So before I get into really any of that, I'd like to tell a little bit more detail about someone that many of you probably already know and respect. And that is <coughs> Professor Daniel W. Halpin. Uh, professor Halpin is an emeritus professor at Purdue University. He's an inducted member of the National Academy of Construction. He's the author of seven books, and as Barnaz mentioned, uh, you may know Professor Halpin, even if you don't know Professor Halpin, because you might be using his uh, textbook in your classes. There you go. Um, he has received a number of honors, uh, only two of which I'll show here today. Uh, that is the ASC Pure Foy Construction Research Award, which is the highest award for construction scholarship by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Carl Haas went ahead and made his presentation at this uh, conference, and the Carol H. Dunn Award for Excellence, uh, which is awarded by the Construction Industry Institute, typically not won by faculty, uh, but for anybody who's made an extremely strong contribution to the industry. Where my research is concerned, it's germane that he is also one of the world leading authorities on simulation of construction processes. We do simulation work, which I'll explain in my presentation. Um, and in 2011, the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, created the Daniel W. Halpin Award. Um, it was first awarded in 2012. Oh, In 2012, the first uh, awardee, Vinit Kamat, uh, received the award, so I joined these three esteemed colleagues and friends. 2013, Gunnar Loco of the Catholic University of America uh, won the award, and then last year, Sang Hyung Lee of the University of Michigan won the award. Now, we're all, uh, Gunnar and Sang Hyung and I, a little bit jealous of uh, Vinit because he received the award directly from Professor Halpin, who is not here today either, but I received a note from Professor Halpin that he will be there when I receive the award in New York City at the ASCE Annual Conference. I was asked to say a little bit about who am I. I know Chema already gave uh, uh, quite a detailed um, picture of that. For those that uh, know me, if you're looking at these pictures and you're assuming these are places I lived, probably thinking that uh, the picture on the bottom right is uh, Blacksburg, Virginia, where I live now. Uh, it's not true. This is actually where I grew up uh, in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. Looks very similar. That's my father. Uh, I'm a dyed in the wool construction person. Even though some of the research I present today may not, may not seem like uh, field construction research. And my father uh, owned a construction company, my grandfather a building materials company, and my other grandfather was the building inspector for the city. And so, a um, uh, great deal of construction in my past. But living out in the country on a horse ranch, uh, you dream of going other places besides the country and horse ranches. So the first stop off on my journey was New Orleans. Uh, that house above my father there is right on the Mardi Gras parade route in New Orleans. And so you can imagine that second story balcony having about 120 year olds on it, fighting each other for 50 cent beads during Mardi Gras parades. But I did find time to do a little bit of studying. I uh, studied at Tulane University for undergraduate and master's uh, studies. And there was Professor Bruce Angelides and Bakir mentored me and, and really stimulated my interest in, in research. I stayed in New Orleans uh, for five years and worked in uh, heavy civil construction as an estimator and project manager, which is important for me for the research that I do, that I had some experience working inside the industry. And I got the bug to see something, uh, something different, uh, the picture in the middle is uh, Switzerland, uh, as, as Jane mentioned. I studied at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. I had the opportunity to work with professors uh, Pere, Stricker, Tucci, and Royston. And what was really nice about my time in Switzerland is I had the opportunity to teach and learned then that I really liked teaching and wanted to pursue a PhD, which brings me to the top left picture. Went out to Stanford to do my PhD, Worked with an amazing uh, committee, Ray Levitt and Bob Tatum, two of the leading thinkers in our field, as well as Dick Scott and Steve Barley, two leaders in, in their fields, their respective fields, which weren't construction 
Started my faculty career out, uh, uh, at least as a full-time faculty, Jimmy mentioned some other kind of smaller appointments. Uh, at UT Austin, the picture on the bottom left is of Austin, Texas. Um, had the opportunity to uh, be mentored by Richard Tucker, another leading thinker in our field, the founder of the Construction Industry Institute, and started a collaboration with Wayne Crew and Steve Thomas of the CII, uh, which has continued throughout my entire career to today. And then to see something about as different from Tennessee, as you can imagine, I moved to New York City and worked for four years at Columbia University, where I had the opportunity to work with another luminary from our field, Penyasi Penny Morris, who's pictured on the right, uh, next to my father, and uh, Professor Diodatus and Culligan, who aren't in our field, but are leading experts in their field. So after all these adventures, I uh, longed for the, the quiet of the horse ranch and home and, and came to Virginia Tech. Uh, and so Virginia Tech, as you see from the pictures here on the left, beautiful rural mountain campus in southwest Virginia, uh, nestled in uh, uh, forest and mountains. I personally sit in the Vesalio Construction Engineering Management Program, which is a wonderful opportunity for me to get mentorship from Professor Lagarza, who introduced me here today, and Professor Mike Worcester, who's an emeritus professor and one of the leading thinkers in uh, heavy equipment uh, to this day. I also collaborated with Mike Garvin, who's pictured in the middle there, on a number of projects. Virginia Tech also has a school of construction, which has multiple colleges associated with it. The Myers Lawson School of Construction. This is a director, Brian Feiner, of the school. I collaborate with Brian. There are about 20 affiliated faculty in the school. Um, I have a picture here of some of those, plus several from biology and other departments around the university that are part of a, a huge new PhD program that we've started at Virginia Tech, which is on bio-inspired building. And I'll mention just one of the projects associated with that later in the presentation. So enough uh, background. Uh, when I get into what, what do I mean by Le Field Rouge, uh, literally, it's Le Field Rouge for, um, for those that don't speak French, is the, the red thread or the red wire or the red line. And that's why you'll see red thread uh, continuously through this presentation. That's the literal definition. Figuratively, uh, in French, you would use the term le fil rouge to, to describe how things that are apparently not connected are actually connected. And so you would say the fil rouge is the main theme or the common thread of these apparently disparate um, items. Uh, it can also mean the guiding light, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'll focus on it being the common thread. A common thread for my research is, is network dynamics. Uh, network dynamics has two components, the networks and the dynamics. And so first uh, question is, is the industry actually dynamic? Uh, I had worked uh, in the, um, within the industry for Verde Construction Company and also started uh, several uh, companies uh, that served the industry. And so I'd had the experience from the technology solution provider trying to sell into the industry and someone within the industry working within the confines of its structure. Uh, but we, if we read the innovation literature, we would hear that our industry is a laggard. So you might get the sense that it's actually not very dynamic. So if you look around at what's changing, uh, one thing that's changing is, is CAD, uh, 3D CAD, 4D CAD, 5D CAD, ND CAD, XD CAD. Uh, uh, BIM, building information modeling alone, is a, is a huge dynamic impacting the industry. But that's just one dynamic. We have disasters of increasing severity and frequency that we as an industry need to quickly respond to and the, the quickness of the response is a, is a critical issue for us to resolve as we get people to help that they need. Uh, the industry is globalizing. National cultural boundaries, sorry, national boundaries are, are weakening. We're seeing uh, competition within our countries from, from companies in other countries. And when you're trying to work across that cross-cultural boundary, it can create uh, challenges. Uh, there are virtual collaboration technologies. When we're going to work at a distance, we have to use some tools. And so how do those tools affect our work? Uh, those tools are very dynamic. Uh, there are new types of building systems. Uh, there are technologies. This is an RFID tag, which we can connect to our building systems to have a better understanding of what's happening during the life cycle of a facility after it's built, during the operational phase. New project delivery, uh, integrated project delivery, PPPs. Uh, we are expected to have increasingly energy efficient buildings. Lead certification, uh, the last time I checked, was still experiencing exponential growth in terms of the number of applications for certification. Uh, we have young people uh, entering our workforce. 
that have a very different worldview from the baby boomer generation uh, that is leading these organizations. That's a change. We are a cyclical industry, so we have economic crises recently. Uh, radical new ways of designing buildings. This is a Calatrava turning torso building where the, 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 the core of the building is designed after a human spine. This is a plotting of a building, 3D plot using concrete. This is a construction worker. We have IT in the field um, in many different ways than is shown here. In this case, this uh, is a construction field worker operating a drone to keep track of construction progress. And so uh, looking across the room, if, if everyone were to raise their hand, we have time for that, and talk about the things that they know are changing, I think we could find that this list is actually a very short list compared to what's really happening, which makes me wonder, um, well, is the industry dynamic? You could almost say that it's under construction. There's so much change going on. Now, uh, I'll show you pictures of my lovely daughters at the end of the presentation, but I do tend to liken things to children's books because I have the, the girls. And one of the, of the quotes that I've used before, which every time I think about taking out of a presentation like this, I leave it in because it's so perfect, is from the Alice in Wonderland stories by Lewis Carroll. Uh, Alice goes through the rabbit hole, she's in Wonderland, she meets the Red Queen, and she says to the Red Queen, excuse me, well, in our country, uh, you generally get to somewhere else if you ran very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. To which the Red Queen replies, what a slow sort of country. Here, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you have to run at least twice as fast as that. And so as, as an industry, uh, in my view, uh, from my work experience and from the, the research that I've done, very often, we don't have the time to adjust to one change before the next change and the next change. So we're still trying to get the productive benefit from one change before, uh, we, um, uh, before we're asked to actually uh, try another change. And it impacts our productivity. So that's the dynamics on the network side. Uh, I had had an intuition from working in the industry that the project network structure of the industry may have a lot to say. Uh, 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 Professor Lagarde said more about that than I'll say, uh, but uh, there's a report by the uh, National Academies uh, which says that uh, get, networks are everywhere in our lives. We're totally dependent on networks, talking about both engineered networks and human networks. Uh, and the committee was amazed at the abundance of interest, uh, but the lack of fundamental scientific research. And so I chose to focus my efforts in dynamics using the lens of networks. And so the common thread uh, in my laboratory uh, that I created at Virginia Tech is network dynamics. Our mission uh, that we, um, you'll find it if you go to our website is to examine, model, and improve, if possible, systemic change in engineering networks of industrial and societal importance. We've studied a number of dynamics to date, more than the, the, the three Professor Lagarza mentioned, so I'll add those others. Uh, we started out studying information system integration in my PhD, I studied BIM and how organizational networks uh, uh, help or hinder the adoption and implementation of BIM in, in uh, construction business networks. We've studied globalization, how uh, when uh, we have uh, companies from different countries now working together, what is the impact of that cross-cultural boundary on the performance of firms in that business network? Uh, sort of combining these two together, we've studied workforce virtualization and those virtual collaboration technologies I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, what effect does that have on productivity and what new theories can we develop that might improve how virtual teams work in our field? And then all three of those focused on the, the project network structure of the industry. Uh, look, we uh, look, started looking into uh, energy efficiency in buildings and for that uh, looked at a different kind of network. In that case, the, the network are the occupants of a building like, like us in this room. And most recently, we've been studying disaster uh, mobility. So looking at urban populations and how when a natural disaster occurs, it affects the mobility of the citizens that live uh, uh, in the city. Today, we've been looking at it in cities. And so the fil rouge or the common thread that connects these uh, apparently disparate uh, um, areas of research or application areas of research is that we're always looking at something that in, in our opinion or my opinion, is of some importance industrially or societally, and in each case, we're looking at it from the lens of networks. Now, let me be slightly more precise. 
Uh, network dynamics, we start by studying the network structure. Uh, the structure can be uh, the individuals in this room. So the circles in the network diagram at the top are the individuals, and the edges that are connecting them might be the relationships between the people. It could be their coworkers, it could be friends, it could be companies working in a network. Uh, but today, for the example in, in this room, we can say people that are affiliated in some way through work um, um, or, or as friends. We measure the initial performance of the network. Now, this isn't network dynamics. This is setting up the baseline to study network dynamics. Now, I have, if I'm the node that's dark in the middle, if I have an energy conservation practice that I think is a great idea, uh, and I measure the performance of the network before I start to pass along that idea, that would be our initial performance. I would perturb the network by passing along that idea perhaps to Professor Lagarza. He might pass it on to the people he's connected with, he passed it on to the people they're connected with. And after some period of time, we may reach an equilibrium. Uh, the network dynamics would be everything that occurs after that perturbation. So how does this idea flow? Uh, uh, who passes it to who? How does it perhaps even affect the structure of the network? And importantly, how does our energy use, how does our energy consumption change over time as a result of this, of this innovation or this idea diffusing through the network? We do that uh, in a couple of different ways, principally in a couple of different ways in the lab, uh, through simulation. Usually, uh, we don't do so much of this, but it's exciting research uh, when you're doing simulation to uh, generate theory, so inductive simulation to figure out what are the uh, important constructs, how do those constructs fit together into propositions, and how might those tie together into a theory, uh, either an existing one or a new theory. Uh, but once we have an idea of an intervention that might be interesting to study uh, out in an experiment, we conduct more deductive type of research doing experiments, and that's more akin to what we see on the left. Uh, we would measure the existing structure of the network, we would look at the interactions that occur after some perturbation occurs, uh, we can look at the properties of the network. Does the, do the properties of the network change over time? How does the practice or whatever it is that is being implemented uh, diffuse through the network? And, and as a dependent variable, typically we'll measure some, some type of performance, whether it be productivity in a project network or energy efficiency in an uh, energy efficient, uh, excuse me, energy consumption in an energy efficiency experiment. And then we might do simulation again, but this time more predictive uh, simulation. So rather than just trying to uh, understand what's happening, we're taking what we can understand from maybe what we figured out in this room about the effect of this particular practice once it's diffused through the network on our energy consumption. If we want to scale that to the whole building or scale to the whole campus or even the whole city of Vancouver. So the, the common thread of my research is, is network dynamics. Uh, but being an engineer, I couldn't help learning a little bit more about thread. And so it turns out if you look really close at thread, or when you study how it's made, it's actually not a thread at all. Uh, thread is actually threads. Typically, it's three threads that are interwoven together, and we perceive it as a single thread. And so I uh, reassessed uh, my research uh, from this perspective of common threads, and it ties back to what is our laboratory logo. And so by far the biggest cog, the biggest wheel in the system of the lab in terms of the research that we do is theory building. But if we're gonna perturb a network, uh, very often we have to create uh, whatever it is that we're gonna perturb it with. Uh, and I'll explain uh, that with the various uh, research that we're doing. So we end up doing a lot of enabling software and technology development. Uh, so a little bit of computing. Uh, and I'm a firm believer that there's nothing quite as practical as a good theory. And so we, we also try and take what we've done in our enabling software and technology development and in our theory building and try and apply it in companies. So uh, having, having established the three areas, theory development and application, we can, we can look at that across all of the research areas. I am um, not able to go into detail in all of these areas. Uh, so for the purposes of the discussion today, what I'd like to do is just give a very high-level uh, description of what we've done uh, in the four areas not highlighted here. And then I'll give some detail about uh, energy efficiency. So hopefully by showing you uh, one slice of what we're doing, you can get a picture for, for um, what network dynamics means in my laboratory. With uh, information system integration, uh, we started out studying BIM, as I said. The kinds of theories that we tried to um, uh, develop were related to alignment. 
did then align up with the, uh, the way work is distributed in a business network. We looked at the absorptive capacity of a business network to adopt changes, uh, starting with BIM and then other types of, of technologies as well that cross organizational boundaries. We looked at uh, BIM as a, as a um, boundary object creator. And what effect did that have on firms' uh, ability to exchange knowledge? We looked at, uh, again in theory, whether or not we could design business networks that were robust to changes like BIM. And lastly, we looked at uh, the economic holdup problem. Um, so what happens when I'm further down the learning curve than you and we're in a business network? How did the distribution of those benefits get shared? We didn't do any development uh, in this area. But we had, had done quite a bit of application uh, with Autodesk, who funded the initial uh, research in this area, and also with Procter & Gamble. In their uh, globalization, again, uh, we started off by doing theory building efforts before getting into development and application. Uh, with that, we took the ideas from uh, robust design in BIM and looked at whether or not we could design business networks that were robust to the intercultural issues that I mentioned earlier. In the process, we identified a kind of worker on a global team that's, that enables efficiency gains, and that is a cultural boundary spanner, have a number of works associated with that. We studied the market dynamics, how different countries are, are growing uh, in terms of their um, shared market and why. Uh, we developed a globalizing index to study firm level um, growth. Uh, we have received uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, support from the Construction Industry Institute in these efforts. We've developed two tools, the first of which, um, the GLOBE with the GSAC, is a globalizing self-assessment tool that companies can use to uh, estimate uh, their global reach, so what is their um, uh, international revenue profile, but also their degree of global integration, how are they profiting from those activities. We've developed an international readiness passport which helps firms to uh, take best practices that are working well in their home country and apply them successfully in other countries. Uh, we ended up developing, in the case of workforce vir virtualization, developing the technology first. So we needed the technology in order to study the perturbation, developed a, a virtual collaboration technology called the CyberGrid. We had observed in the globalization studies that uh, the tools that were there to support uh, globally distributed work in our industry didn't really support the kind of dimensionally complex work uh, we do in our field. And so we implemented the cyber grid and started studying in this new working environment, how does knowledge get created? How do we uh, transform knowledge? We looked at what are the appropriate roles and backgrounds for facilitation and leadership on these kinds of teams. We took the ideas from the BIM work and studied how boundary objects might play a role. We found that it played a very important role in uh, impacting that cross-cultural boundary. And we looked at how teams kept track of who knew what when they only represented there as avatars. This work has been in collaboration with Kiewit, Skanska, and Turner. We currently have an implementation with Kiewit where they, they're um, uh, putting their interns in this virtual world to see if it might play a role in employee retention. And there are uh, people from Canada and the United States in this uh, excuse me, application. I'm not going to talk about energy efficiency because I'm going to talk about it in a little bit more detail in a moment. But in terms of disaster mobility, we had to develop uh, uh, some uh, a tool in order to uh, both collect and analyze data on human movements uh, in a city. And then we use that to develop theories about uh, the resilience of an urban population's mobility uh, given the impact of a natural disaster. We look at what happens when that mobility is constrained by infrastructure breaking down. And we looked at the absorptive capacity of a city. So looking at different uh, severity levels, for example, the category level of a hurricane or a typhoon, what effect does it have on mobility? And how important is the state of the infrastructure network in determining that? And we've just started our first application this summer with some funding from CIB to look at infrastructure failures in disasters. And so those are uh, the four areas I'm not going to comment on in detail. I do want to mention some collaborators that have, that have participated in this, in this research. I'm not going to mention all these people, just the people that I uh, expected would be here based on the proceedings. Uh, Professor De La Garza in the bottom left and I collaborated on the International Readiness Passport research. John Messner, I don't know if John's here, but I've seen his name in the proceedings. 
uh, uh, collaborated on the global self-assessment tool, and Amy Jack McWill and I on the top there have collaborated on an NSF project in the area of globalization. Uh, the group that works with me in the cyber grid research is probably wondering why I'm not choosing to focus on that for this presentation, but a large number of collaborators, by far the longest standing research in the group, but I had to focus the camera somewhere, uh, and that is uh, Carrie sturtz Gossick and I uh, wrote the first cyber grid proposal together in the National Science Foundation. Uh, Ann Anderson, um, can't point, uh, can I, you still have the pointer fun? Mine is not working at all. And so Ann Anderson and Samuel Chemu both did their PhDs on cyber grid related topics in both faculty now and at the at Washington State University in Samara at uh, Boise University, and uh, Tima Hartman, who's been collaborating uh, on cyber grid since the beginning. I didn't mention uh, Amy, she's here a second time. <coughs> Excuse me, she and I have a, a grant from the Construction Industry Institute to look at how we can maximize the productivity of virtual, team, virtual teams in the engineering construction industry. So now I hope uh, by focusing in on just this sliver for about uh, 10 or so minutes, uh, you can get a sense of the whole tapestry of network dynamics. So energy in the built environment. Uh, if you've attended any of the presentations about uh, energy in the built environment, this conference or any conference, they all have a slide like this, which says that buildings need a lot of energy. 40% uh, of energy consumption in the United States uh, hasn't changed very much, is uh, due to uh, consumption by buildings. Uh, but when we introduce new technologies to save energy, sometimes and very often there's a take-back effect. So if I implement something that is going to save me energy, I use the appliance more. And so here you see this uh, compact fluorescent bulbs, uh, which are on during the daytime. <clears throat> and we have a recent report from the National Academies which says that uh, the potential savings of existing energy efficiency technologies, if we develop no new energy efficiency technologies, it would more than offset projected energy use increases through 2030. And so implementing these technologies better would be a big, a big help in the energy picture. Uh, back when we started this research in 2008, uh, there, there wasn't research that was applying uh, social networks, even though they were in every aspect of our lives. I still, this is the same picture from years ago. I think some of these don't exist anymore, but even back in 2008, we were constantly being bar by, bombarded uh, by, by various networking type uh, social media. Uh, and so I would say we lacked, but I would even say we still lack research on the impact of uh, networks on energy use in buildings, and by that I mean human networks. So the broad question we address in this research, what impact do networks have on energy consumption? Uh, I mentioned that we've broken down the research into three areas. I'm going to talk quickly about a system development effort, uh, because we had to develop this system in order to perturb the network and see what happened. Uh, so we developed a couple of testbed buildings, uh, one in Manhattan, Watt Hall. It's a residential building, six floors, 89 rooms. Uh, and a commercial building, the Alliance for Sustainable Colorado, six floors, 115 occupants, commercial building. Uh, in either case, do the people that we're studying directly pay for their energy, and that's important so we can see, we can isolate the effect we're trying to examine in an experiment is, is not being clouded by the cost of energy, and the electric loads are more or less what you would expect. We installed electric load data monitoring and wireless data collection systems in each of these uh, buildings. And then we had to create an eco-feedback application. We had to uh, insert something into the system, into the, uh, the network in the buildings to see how it would affect their energy use. In both cases, uh, so on the left is Watt Hall's residential eco-feedback system. You know, a picture here of Monty Gulp of our farm, who collaborated, collaborated with us on the write-up of this uh, information system for a journal article. Uh, and on the right, our commercial building eco-feedback system, BizWatt's. And so once we have these applications, we have the systems in place, we could design experiments to see um, what effect we could have on energy use considering networks. Now before we get into theory development, we had to make sure that the system actually worked. And so we, here's a, a short experiment we did on the residential eco-feedback system. Uh, we wanted to make sure that when people use it, they actually save energy or else it would be kind of silly to, to run the experiment. And so we did a study with 54 participants, and in this case we were studying clickstream data. What do people click, and how much energy do they use? 
top 1,400 data points uh, over the time period. We found that people that used the site more uh, uh, were correlated with more energy savings, which is good. That means feedback can work. And we also looked into what are the kinds of features that were most associated with energy use reductions. And those were historical comparisons of so the ability to see what I've used in the past uh, and uh, what my friends have used in the past and incentives, and those being non-monetary incentives. That work is in collaboration with Rishi Jain, PhD student who's now at Stanford doing postdoc. Now into theory development, so we're interested in uh, do peer networks uh, affect energy use? Uh, we reiterate with this study that the, the eco-feedback system did result in savings by and large, but we zoomed in in a little bit more detail to look at the impact of networks. One of the first things we noticed, if you see the, the chart there, and I can't go into uh, great detail, uh, but there was a response relapse pattern, which is to say, once feedback is given, if this is the gray bar when you're aware of your energy use, and you look at people's energy consumption, that tends to drop. So after you know how much you're using, you start to save energy. But after a few days, that consumption starts to creep back up to your pre-perturbation uh, levels. Uh, and so we found that these reductions follow the response relapse pattern in residential networks, not, not peer networks, as everybody in the study. And then we isolated them into three groups, which is what is pictured here. Group A's energy use is they saw only kilowatt hours. Group B saw kilowatt hours, but they also could see the building average energy use. And group C could see those plus that of their peers in the building. And when we broke it into these study groups, the only group that had a statistically significant reduction in energy use was the peer network group. And so we found that peer networks uh, did matter here. They saved about 28%, uh, but it was a short study period. Uh, that work was in collaboration with Gav Pesquier, who's now working for an energy startup EcoRhythm, and Jeff Siegel, who's a professor at the University of Toronto, who was a visiting faculty when we did the research. Uh, so that's peer networks. Now in commercial buildings, what about organizational networks? We kind of wondered if they might have a different effect on energy consumption if instead of my friends, I could see the, re the energy use of my colleagues. And so in this case, uh, individual feedback, again, did not lead to significant savings. So if I just saw my kilowatt hour use at my workstation, I didn't change it. But uh, when we allowed people to see the energy use of the others in their organizational network or their work group colleagues, it resulted in a statistic statistically significant reduction in energy use. Not as great, 7%, but it sustained, it sustained for longer than in the residential building networks. Excuse me. Uh, and importantly, it did not suffer from that response relapse uh, pattern that we observed in, in peer networks. That work's been done in collaboration with Ernest Goldenis, a PhD student who's now actually starting up a, a company, a spin off of this research at um, Cornell has a, a postdoc for entrepreneurial activities. So he's in New York City. Uh, so th those are a couple of experiments. We also, as I said, might take and try and extrapolate, try and project our findings more broadly or do things that we couldn't do with humans in a building. And so we use the energy consumption that we collected from multiple years of experiments to create agents that consume energy. We gave them the baseline energy consumption. This, uh, this is the uh, log normal distribution of energy consumption of the building users over the three years before we perturbed the network. Then we looked at, well, what, what, could a, what could a building manager do? What are some things that they might uh, do to affect energy use? They could expand the network, you know, have, have more people uh, in the network. They could make the network uh, more dense, meaning more connections between people, host events where people get to know each other. Uh, they could be uh, tighter, uh, so go from being a friend to a close friend or an acquaintance to a friend. We found that expanding the network didn't have an effect on energy consumption, but that uh, making it more dense and more tight did. So this would be an example of a, a pure simulation work, but building off of the uh, energy consumption data we collected over multiple experiments. Uh, this work is in collaboration with Jiayu Chen, who's now faculty at City University Hong Kong. Uh, we, we started to think, uh, could, we, could we treat buildings as a network? Do we have to treat people as a network? Could buildings themselves be a network? And so we started to examine the potential for there being an inter-building effect where one building might affect the energy use of another building. Uh, we modeled a network of buildings. It's a little bit hard to see, but 
That is the control building. And so we modeled that building in Energy Plus if it was by itself. And then we modeled it as if it were in this block. This is a real block outside of New York City, so a quasi-urban setting. And we looked at what, what would be the difference in the um, predictions of Energy Plus if we considered mutual reflection, uh, uh, mutual shading, and the impact on air flows. And we found that uh, it did have a pretty dramatic effect on the amount of HVAC energy required for the buildings, as much as 58% uh, off in the summer in Miami. So we placed this building in the hottest and the coldest city in the United States. I'll let you guess which is which. Uh, and as much as 32% in the winter in Minneapolis. And so we found that there was this important interbuilding effect Anna Laura Pozzello, who really led that research as a student, is now faculty at the University of Perugia, and this is really uh, where she's focusing her, her career efforts now. I also collaborate with Shashi Chen, uh, who's now in McKinsey and Company, a uh, former student. So just to show one application beyond the theory building efforts, uh, we were asked at the university to participate in a water conservation program across all of the dormitories, and so now we're not talking about 100 or 200 people, but rather thousands of people being affected by our, our feedback system. And so uh, they were interested in water, we said we do energy, so we met in the middle. Uh, and we did a six week study where we gave uh, uh, residents in six of the buildings their water feedback in gallons. We gave uh, residents in six other buildings their feedback in water and energy. And then we had the remaining six for the control group for comparison. We found that the guy gallons didn't uh, statistically change their energy use, they didn't reduce their energy use in any consistent fashion, but that the water energy group uh, did. Again, the percentage isn't that high, uh, but it was significant um, that if people were aware of how much energy was embodied, right, how much energy does it, does it take to get the water to your building, to heat the water for your building, to purify the water. That work was done with Sung Yong, who's now working in the industry. So I wanted to mention, running short on time, but a few things that we're doing now. I'll be quick about this. And uh, one of my mentors, Jeff Russell, uh, I was sitting with him, talking to him in particular about that BioBuild program. I was saying, I just don't know if this is really a good fit uh, for uh, network dynamics. And here I am telling you there's this field rouge. You have to, everything has to fit. He said, you know what, JT, sometimes you just have to do some cool stuff. And so here's some of the cool stuff that we're doing. Uh, the system development area, we're trying to get energy into BIM models. We've managed to get energy into the BIM model. Uh, our, our purpose isn't so much to get the energy in the BIM model, but rather here are 2D and 3D uh, representations of the energy from that New York City building. We want to use this as a form of feedback. And our goal with that is to make BIM more useful in the life cycle of a building, if it can be used to actually help people to save energy. That work is with Han Trong, a current student. Uh, we're also developing systems. We, 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 we and others treat everybody in the building as if they're the same, but yet people have very different uh, consumption profiles. So we've been classifying the occupants and we're looking at ways we can give targeted, context-aware feedback, and so we're in the process of developing that system. We're going to run our first experiment here this fall. Uh, that's with Arlan Khosrapur, current student. And then the cool bio-inspired stuff. We have um, uh, studied a flower. This flower is a snowdrop flower, which is why Yilong's nickname is Snowdrop. Uh, and what we notice is a peculiar property. Uh, the inside of this flower is cooler than the ambient temperature around it. So we flip the flower upside down and are investigating what impact could it have on urban canyons and cities? Could we use it as a way to reduce uh, 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 the temperature in cities and address urban heat island effects? And finding, so far we're studying the energy use and finding uh, interesting reductions as a result of this. We've been collecting uh, social media data on energy use, so every tweet in the world about um, uh, energy savings and looking at what, are, what kinds of information gets shared and why. Uh, that work has been done by Ryan Wang, who just graduated a couple weeks ago and just left for Harvard University postdoc. And lastly, uh, urban mobility and energy use. So we, we took the data from our disaster studies where we were interested in people's location and wondered, could we look at people's movement patterns and actually see if there are correlations with energy use? And so this is uh, data from London. We have uh, positional records and we know people's movement patterns based on the account that they're from. And we're comparing using spatial regression uh, individuals' mobility 
with the consumption in various districts. The reason they're using London is uh, they publish the data on energy use in the various districts within the city and finding some interesting correlations. And that work is done with Nada Mahamadi, current student. So if you indulge me, just one last step. Uh, network dynamics, if you look very close, doesn't look uh, like a common thread or common threads, but rather common strains. And so I uh, really like this quote by Chief Seattle, a Native American leader. Man does not leave this web of life. He's merely a strand of it. And so I am really just a strand of network dynamics. You might think I've put a lot of pictures into this presentation, but I want to reflect back uh, that for this Daniel Halpin Award, it certainly isn't uh, my efforts uh, that led to this, but the efforts of a large number of people. Um, each of these people has had a crucial impact on my career. The network has uh, shaped me and continues to shape me as a researcher. And so I think we can, we can describe, uh, if we were to boil it down in a recursive fashion, uh, the strands that make up network dynamics are actually this dynamic network of scholars. Uh, quick additional acknowledgments. I mentioned there are a lot of industrial collaborators, many more than I showed in that matrix. I want to at least get them up on the slide here and I'll mention the names. Uh, this work certainly wouldn't have been possible without a lot of funding from the National Science Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, the Department of Energy, the Construction Industry Institute, and the Earth Institute, uh, as well as Virginia Tech, this new PhD program grant. And so uh, very grateful for the funding. And if I could just completely close now with the other field rouge, I said I was going to focus this presentation on the meaning common thread. But if you remember, there was another meaning, which was guiding light. And so the guiding light for my research is actually my, my family, uh, in particular my beautiful daughters, whom I read uh, Lewis Carroll stories too. Actually, now they read to me, they're, they're older. Um, but they actually uh, truly do affect what we choose to research. If you look at this arrow, which roughly corresponds to uh, the types of applications we've been studying, we've gone from BIM, uh, workforce virtualization, cross-cultural differences, energy efficiency in the environment, and keeping people safe in disasters. And so what my daughters pushed me to do is to make sure that the research that we're doing in network dynamics can actually matter and make a difference in people's lives. Uh, if you don't have um, children to make you selfishly altruistic, I think the National Academies give us the same call uh, in these reports where they ask us to ask ourselves, how can our research address the grand challenges facing our industry, our society, and our world? And so I'll finish with that, more or less on time. Uh, thank you very much.